This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Right, and remember this is just the magnetic field. I've also got to multiply it by the electric field, right? So therefore, what I get in my electric field, um, the power goes on one, as one and R squared. If I've got R squared and then I've got another R squared for my electric field, it would go as over R cubed or R to the fourth, which means that the distance is significantly diminished. Okay, so we went through the process of then determining from the vector magnetic potential the electric field, we had the two electric field components, and here we saw that the radial field had a, an ear and a, and a, and a uh, had also two components, but here they all go as R squared, right? So this indicates the e to the R component is all near field, right? Whereas e to the theta goes as one on R, R squared, R to the fifth. Then we went through the process of, you know, having uh, defined the pointing vector, um, which is the power density. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, we defined the, the pointing vector. We did some um, algebra and we worked out um, the uh, power uh, density as a function of radius. And we saw there's an R squared and a, an R cubed component. Again. Okay. All right. I think I know where I've got to put it now. Okay. So, yeah, we've got the R squared component. And that tells us what our, our power density is in the, in the radial component in the far field. We, and that's the R squared. Now, the R cubed, we, we, you know, which is the theta component, we ignore because that goes as R cubed and R to the fifth, right? So, really, the only thing that we care about which dictates the, the power or at least the, the pattern in the far field is it's a, um, the, the pointing vector in the, in the radial component. Now, having done that, um, we realised that we had to um, okay, work out the total power. I integrated over a, a sphere, right? And that's where the R squared sine theta d theta d phi should be, sorry. Um, and worked out the, the power, the total radiated power. And just for everyone's benefit, we said that the power, the total power is the power that's radiated plus there's a component which is the imaginary component which, which is actually stored in the fields, right? And we had a little bit of a discussion on, um, you know, the imaginary component, and this is, because this is the J component, that's, that, that's just the energy stored in the fields. That's not actually radiated, not particularly... U it's useful in the sense that it, it, it is used to generate the fields which are ne necessary in order to radiate, but not, not, it's, that energy is just stored in the fields. It's not actually radiated. It's not in, in, in any way useful in transferring um, data or being able to communicate with that, uh, with that energy. Now, we did a little bit of a trick, um, and we worked out um, what the power of the radiated power was um, by just looking at the uh, real component. And what we said is this is the same as half uh, I squared, and, and define this fictitious um, radiation resistance. And all I did here was transpose in order to find the, the radiation resistance. And, and, and all I was doing there was essentially say, well, if we had the radiation resistance, we can now understand or appreciate or able to be able to calculate um, how much of the energy that we put into this antenna is actually uh, radiated as a useful signal from this, from this particular structure. And what we found, as an example, was, hey, if we've got 
this infinitesimal di dipole and I said, well, if the length is lambda on 50, um, which is a little bit of a poor approximation because we, we said this is infinitesimal, really, um, we we're also going to do what a small dipole looks like. But anyway, we worked out what the radiation resistance was and we said it was, and it found out that it was only 0.3 of an ohm. And it was, it sh you know, it, you know, I tried to emphasize, but it should also be obvious to everyone that given this low radiation resistance, um, what it says is an infinitesimal dipole is not an efficient radiator. Right. So if you're trying to build uh, one of these devices, if you're trying to be have a dipole which is small and you're trying to radiate at long distances, well, you're going to use a lot of power. Right? It's not very efficient, so you, you wouldn't do it. But you know, if you've but if you've got a strong uh, receiver or a very capable transmitter, or you know, like for example, an AM radio station, which you're pump pumping out many, many, many kilowatts, then you could probably tolerate it and include it in one of these devices, even though it's a significant, really small portion of the wavelength. Now, um, all I was going to do next, so this is a new part of the lecture, was talk about the three radiation fields, the regions of, mm -hmm. of this uh, dipole. And I was going to say, all I've done is just done the mathematics and said, well, the radial component, if you look at the, the components that we've looked at previously, the radial component goes as 1 on R cubed for the electric field, E theta goes as 1 on R cubed, and... Um, the, the magnetic field as a function of theta goes as one and R squared. Now, the, the point here is, th there's a couple of points. The first point is, you can see that the fields can become very, very large near the antenna structure itself. Um, and it's always good advice, I mean, no, although nobody uses an infinitesimal dipole, but it's always very good advice not to go touch an antenna, right? Because what it's saying is the electric field near the surface of the antenna can be quite large. And also, the, the other thing that you'll find is when you're trying to work out a radiation pattern of an antenna, um, you've got to measure it appropriately, <coughs> right? Um, now, what you'll find is usually in most cases, you've got a PCB board, um, and you're trying to work out what is actually radiating in, in some circumstances, right? So therefore, okay, you built a PCB board, you've sent it to, I said I was going to check this up, but I've forgotten. You sent it to the FCC or ACMA. What was the Chi one in China called? The regulator in China. Okay, you sent it to the regulator, all right? So if you build a PCB board or a product, it has to be approved. You can't just send it out there to be used, right? Because if it, if it unintentionally radiates in certain bands, it can be very problematic, right? Because it can actually stop other people listening to their AM radio station. It can be cause interference or whatever. So the point of this was, the other point of, for, for this is that when you're actually trying to work out what's radiating, it, it is also very challenging because ideally what you want to do is try to put it next to um, whatever's on the board, right? So you can say, oh, this is what's radiating. But unfortunately, what this is saying to you is also, hey, if you go close to the board, you're only actually just seeing the near field patterns, which aren't necessarily telling, telling you anything about the far field radiation, which is what the, the regulators care about, right? So therefore, you, you've got this quick conundrum where you want to work out what, what's radiating, but as you go close, and you try to probe, it's it's not giving you can't get the information that you need. Right? So that's where it becomes interesting. And as you're doing high speed electronics, um, high speed boards and high speed chips, the most challenging component, one of the most challenging components, I shouldn't say the, the most challenging, one of the one of the most challenging components is everything radiates. Right? So what, what happens is as a, as a graduate student or you know, a newly minted engineer, you'll think, oh, I can build these very fast PCB boards and they're gonna be great, look, it works at 10 gigahertz, fantastic. 
and then you send it to the um, to the regulator and they test and they go, guess what, Got, you know, boys and girls, this radiates. Uh uh, take it back, fix it. And that's where the where the challenges really lie in the sense of how do you figure out where it's radiating and how do you stop it from radiating um, in order to be able to have a product that you can actually sell or use. Anyway, um, so this is the, 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 the near field. We talked about, oh sorry, we haven't talked about, we're going to talk about the intermediate field. And this goes, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the components go as R, R squared or R or you know, in both the E to the, the R and E to the theta. And then, most importantly, uh, we've got the far field region, which is the region that's far from the antenna and it's actually where the signal, um, you know, uh, there's actually radiation or there's actually electromagnetic propagation. And what we found, for the, at least for the uh, far field region on a dipole, We've got e to the theta has the following structure, or the following equation. Uh, e to the r is approximately equal to zero, right? Um, because if you think about it, a dipole, it's the field is actually, you know, around rather than just right, sorry, it's across rather than radially. And also for H HFI, if you've got a dipole, you know, it's the current that's actually flowing on that um, the right hand wall which tells us what, what the field is going to be. And importantly, what we found in the past, and it just this is just to reiterate, if you're in the far field, and this is important because if someone tells you, even you know, either regulators or you know, a, a, a pesky uh, academic you know, writing a, an exam question for you, if you're told the radiation or the um, the electric field in the far field, you can always work out what the uh, magnetic field is, right? There's a, there's a relationship between the two, right? So e to the theta on h of the phi, which is the relationship for a T, and essentially what I'm saying here is it's a TEM wave, so these two have to be uh, perpendicular to each other, and the relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field is equal to the wave impedance. Okay. All right, um, then just a little bit more on this infinitesimal dipole. I, we're going to calculate its directivity. So we work out the radiation intensity for that. Uh, we've gone through the calculation. Now remember what I've just said, that you know, if we're in the far field, because we're working at directivity, right? We're in the far field, and directivity only makes sense in the far field, so I've got E and H, but I know that there's a relationship between the E and H in the far field. I can write it as one uh, on eta, e to the theta squared, and I can then, you know, just with a little bit of mathematics, given what we what we've shown um, just previ previously, we have the radiation intensity uh, being, you know, proportional to the current squared and the length of the dipole squared. We can work out the uh, radiation uh, the intensity, um, and then um, we can also use that to work out a dir directivity. And what it says is the directivity of a of a dipole is 1.5. Right. So if if you were going to guess, all right. So we know what do we know about an infinitesimal dipole or a dipole? What's its radiation pattern look like? Remember, I've actually shown you a picture. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, okay. Right. So what, if I said to you, just out of, a, out of curiosity, the directivity of this dipole is 1.5, right? What do we know about its H field? It's, so dipole is what kind of antenna? What kind of radiation pattern? It's a, 
it's not isotropic, right? It's, I mentioned it, omnidirectional. And what does omnidirectional mean? If you can remember. It's directly, but only on one plane, right? So that means on the other plane, it's on, it, it radiates equally. Okay, now, then if I said to you, okay, it's 1.5, and I give, I've given you a rough formula, and, and I, I haven't got it here, but um, for directivity as a function of angles, right? I said directivity is like 41,000 on theta, one multiplied by theta two, right? If theta two is three sixty, what's theta one? Right, one point five equals to forty one thousand on three hundred and sixty multiplied by question mark or theta one. Now you've got to do the the algebra, and if someone can do the algebra, you'll find that it's roughly about sixty degrees, roughly. So that, that way you can actually work out its directivity. All right? this, I'm just trying to get you to know, remember and use some of the previous formulae that, that I'd uh, given you. All right. Interesting, all right? So now you know how to work out the directivity. If you've given the radiate, if you've given a current density on a particular thin um, element or thin Y, you can actually work out its radiation form. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue a little bit and I'll bore you um, for the next uh, few minutes or the next uh, maybe half an hour and talk about what does the radiation uh, pattern and radiation, um, what are the fields and the radiation resistance um, of a small dipole look like. And essentially, all I've done is a definition of a small dipole versus a uh, an infinitesimal dipole is a dipole that's between a fiftieth of a wavelength and a tenth of a wavelength, right? And so what, what there, what I'm saying is the current distribution, which is the standing wave ratio of the current on this particular structure is given by uh, the, 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 uh, the following, which is actually almost like the current distribution is almost like a triangular wave, no, a triangular pattern, I should say. So it's got a triangular distribution. You can, for the time being, as I said, in order to be able to determine this, you have to, you, there's a lot of, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't go through this process. What you would do is you'd put it into an electromagnetic simulator or you would actually measure it. But what I'm saying here is if you, if, I'm giving you this, um, what the current distribution is, right? So really what you should, in the back of your minds, what you should say is, Stan tells me it's a uh, infinitesimal dipole, the current distribution is flat, right? Across the, 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 the length of the antenna. It's a small dipole, you know, it's gonna have this triangular distribution of current. And it's an excellent approximation, right? If you measure it or you, do, you, or you solve uh, Maxwell's equations using an electromagnetic simulator, you'll find that that is actually the case. Now, all I've done there is I've worked out the, you know, used the uh, the calculations or the, the formulae for vector potential, and I've gone through this process and I've derived the vector potential for you. And then what I've done is I've gone through the process and derived the you know, after some calculations, what the far field approximations for the fields are going to be, both for theta and phi, right? And we see that they're roughly the same as they would be for a infinitesimally small dipole. It, but the difference is, if you continue on and you calculate the radiation resistance, is the radiation resistance instead of being eighty. Pi L squared, as it is for. Okay, I'll put these next to each other. I don't know if you can, let's see if you can see that. Yeah. Okay. All I'm doing is shot comparing. Here I'm comparing the radiation resistance for a an infinitesimal dipole and the radiation resistance for a small dipole. The only difference that we see is a factor of four, right? So. 
all you're doing is that that calculation, you now have a factor of four advantage in terms of your radiation resistance. Okay, great, but it's still, what you'll still find is for a finite length or a, for a small dipole, it's, it's better than an infinitesimal dipole, but it's still pretty crappy in terms of radiation resistance. All right, so it's still an, a highly inefficient radiator. Okay? So if you've got the choice, don't use it. All right? But, but, but there are, now you can say to me, Stan, why are you wasting my time? Why are you, why are you doing this to me? Why, why, are you, why are you causing me so much pain? And, and the reason is that, as I said, there are sometimes there are constraints where spa space or size constraints mean that you have to use this small thing. And that's the reason that you um, uh, have to know that. Or the, the other circumstances are you might have put a stub on a transmission line, right? And all of a sudden that's the stub that's actually radiating. So that actually gives you an insight into, hey, I've got this little bit of a stub or this little bit of a hanging wire of my coax. Oh, Maybe that's what's radiating, and that's what uh, the the uh, regulator's picking up, right? Because sometimes they expect you to be ra radiating in certain bands at minus 120 or minus 140 dBm per hertz. All right. Now you might not know what 140 dBm per hertz is, but we'll go talk about that in a couple of lectures' time. Okay. The next thing I wanted to talk about is these finite length dipoles, which is essentially when the dipole is greater than uh, a tenth of the wavelength. Now, what you will find, and again, it's, you, you won't, you're not expected to be able to derive that it's a sinusoidal current distribution, but what it is, is it is a sinusoidal uh, uh, current distribution. Can anyone guess why they think it would be the distribution of the current as a function of Z would be almost sinusoidal? Okay, so what does, what's, a, uh, what's a, a dipole? If you think about it as a transmission line, what is it? And we'll go through a lot of transmission lines starting next lecture. But as a transmission line, what kind of transmission line is it? Short circuit, open circuit? Open circuit, right. So at the edge, what's the current going to be? Zero. Okay. And it, towards, at, at the feed point, what's the current going to be? No, 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 feed point. Not at the end. At the feed point, it must be maximum, right? Right, so therefore, what you know is the current is going to be from maximum at the feed point, zero at the end, right? And then what you'll find is that you'll find, and when we do the mathematics for transmission lines, that the, that distribution actually turns out to be a, a, a sinusoidal distribution. All right? We'll, we'll, we'll show that. But but that's where it comes from. That's where, that's where, that's why... I've got, you know, at least for a longish, um, small or a, a, you know, a, a finite length dipole, we've got the two boundary conditions, maximum current at the feed point, minimum current or zero current at the actual uh, end of the dipole. Um, anyway, go through the, the, the mathematics again. And what we actually see is when we calculate, for example, the, the electric field component, we, by inspection, if you're looking at this, you've got the, what we call the dipole component, the small dipole component. This, if you remember, this is the component that appears also in the infinitesimal dipole. And we've got this integral, right? And usually what we call this integral is the space factor, right? So essentially, all this is saying, other than giving you the machinery or the ability to calculate what the electric field is, it's saying that if you want to work out what the total field is from a, a finite length dipole or a finite length antenna, all you're doing is you're summing up 
a whole bunch of components of, you know, a whole bunch of um, the little infinitesimal dipoles in order to work out the total radiation pattern. That's all you're doing. That's all this is saying. And it's just showing you in a, in a mathematical format on how to do that. Right? So if I said to you, hey, you, um, you've, got a you know, you've got a particular really weird structure, and it's not a dipole, it, it just wiggles around. What is, its, what is its electric field? And I said, the, you know, the electric field from a dipole is this, the space factor is that, then you could trivially work that out. Right, so therefore the mathematics that you need to do is solve for this integral, which is the space factor, or I might give you that space factor in a particular problem. Now, unfortunately, what happens with um, uh, you know that integral is it starts getting pretty involved and it gets pretty difficult uh, to solve um, because, as you can see, you've got a e to the cos theta in the in the integral up here, um, and a z. Anyway, um, so what you find is it's usually just pretty tough to, to solve that. But if you, you know, most books um, actually give you the the values that are themselves. Um, and what you see is the um, results for the far field is given by this formula, and likewise the uh, magnetic field is similarly given by this formula, where the, there's a relationship between the magnetic and, uh, and the electric field. Now, if you were, if you were looking at dipoles and, and the like, no one's ever going to remember these formulas, right? So you never, you never remember these off the top of your head, right? So the only thing that you do here is I'm, do, I'm deriving them for you so that you've actually seen them at least once in your life, right? Um, and that's the point here, that you've seen them once in your life and where it gets interesting, and I guess what you should try to remember, um, uh, is I've got this wrong, so this should be forgiven at length. Something. All right, so there's a mistake here. So, sorry, yeah, there's a mistake there. That shouldn't be lambda. But what you should. Um, uh, this, I think, should be lambda and 10 or something. But the point here is, if you roughly look at the uh, wavelength of, a, um, of one of these di dipoles, um, what you can see is, as you increase, as the length of the dipole increases, the beam width de decreases. And roughly what you should have is, for a small dipole, the beam width's um, approximately 90 degrees in the E plane, right? Because in the H plane, it's what? What's it in the H plane? We talked about it about 20 minutes ago. Yes, it's omnidirectional, perfect, yes. Then we, as we increase the size, as we go from an L on four to L on two, to three lambda on four to lambda, we can actually see that the beam width actually decreases. So we, what we're, what this means is we're getting more directivity, right? So the the advantage of having less directivity is what? Why do we want why do we want some antennas that to be isotropic or as I almost as isotropic? No, if they're isotropic, they're not stronger. Perfect. Yes. What happens is, remember, we chat. We, we talked about it yesterday. You know, if it's omnidirectional, you can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Or I can we chat. I can do this. I can do this. Do this. Right. If it's directional, I can get the, the pattern means that the rate, the power is transmitted in a particular direction. But if I do this, and I'm, you know, my receiver's there or my transmitter's there, all of a sudden I might not be able to get a signal or maintain communication to it. All right. So therefore. But if, I, if it's directional and the other one's directional, what we'll show is that directivity or that di directivity gain allows us to transmit at much larger um, distances. And that's why at base stations, usually what people do is they um, 
have highly directional antennas, and the way that they actually implement the highly directional antennas isn't necessarily using a parabolic dish or a horn. What they actually do is they use this, the, the trick that we said, um, which was the space factor. Remember the space factor, which is the current distribution over the over a surface? What they do is they put, you can use that same trick where you've got multiple dipoles or multiple antennas and you can actually control the relative phase of each of those antennas and you can actually form a beam and you can actually point the beam. All right, so what I would do, or what I would ask for fun um, is for, for you to look up phase the rays because they're really cool, all right? And they're really exciting because one of the things that allows you to do is actually transmit radiation or transmit energy in a particular direction and you can actually control that on the fly. So a lot of base stations, what they do at the moment is they know your last location, they're actually tracking you, and they're actually scheduling a beam in your direction every so often. So therefore, they can actually maintain maximum distance and maintain the link between you and, and the base station. Okay. Who's seen the phased array? I'm sure you've seen that phased array. On the, on the very least, Right, when you look at uh, any of the warships, right, when you're looking at the, the not the whatever, you're looking at the antennas on the on the surface, they're actually phased arrays. There's multiple, there's hundreds or thousands of little elements. What they're, what they're doing is they're phasing them so that they get a very narrow beam so that they can actually pick out a target which has a low rate of cross section, you know, three, four hundred kilometers away. And that's how they do it, right? Okay, now, where it gets pretty hairy and, you know, and, and the mathematics becomes, you know, super challenging in terms of, and, and you have to have it, you know, in order to be able to solve the radiation resistance, um, you get it in terms of these cosine and sine integrals. Again, I don't expect you to remember any of this other than if someone gave you, um, asked you to work out what the radiation resistance or the directivity or whatever for a, but dipole is usually what you have is tables or graphs. And what you find here is if we look at the radiation resistance, we see that you know a half a wavelength dipole has a radiation resistance. You can actually see it's at roughly about 70 ohms. Right? Um, and then that becomes interesting on how do you match it to 50 ohms, and we'll also talk about that in the next few lectures. But also, you actually can see, you know, what the directivity is, uh, which is the solid line um, at half a wavelength. You can actually see go across. It's roughly about 1.5. As you increase uh, the the size of the antenna, one of the things that you see is your radiation resistance goes up, which is again could, is something that's useful. But unfortunately, also does the the um, the input impedance to that antenna, right, which means that a large, a very significant portion of that energy is being used, of the input energy is being used to set up the fields, and the directivity also, you, you get an increase in directivity, but it comes out of a very heavy price, right? And essentially what you would do here, what it's actually saying to you is, if you want high directivity, don't go for a dipole, go for something else, right? But nonetheless, it's, it's important to be able to see all this and actually see how the, um, the radiation resistance, the total input impedance, um, and the directivity of a dipole varies with the length of, the, um, the length of that structure. Okay? Exciting? Or, okay. <laughs> all right, excellent. Now, We've only got a few more minutes, um, and what I'll do is I'll just briefly, 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 let me see if I can find my lecture six. Uh, so what we'll start off next, next lecture, which is on Friday, we'll... You'll have the envious task 
of remembering transmission lines. Ta da! All right. So, you've all done transmission lines before? Yeah. Okay, so do I need to go through them? Should I just skip the lecture? <laughs> no? <laughs> all right. Um, so, what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about transmission lines um, uh, in the next lecture. We'll go through the, the derivation. Uh, and then what we'll do in lecture seven, which is the next Tuesday, is we'll we'll go through why we care about these transmission lines, and if we've got a particular load impedance, what does it, that input impedance look like? And importantly, one of the things that I want you to, to, to try to grasp and understand is most of you have probably seen. Um, uh, transmission lines, but I'm willing to bet um, what you've seen is what happens when you're exciting that transmission line with a sinusoidal um, signal. Has anyone seen what happens or have, have you gone through the process of understanding and, or being lectured on what happens when you rather than exciting uh, this uh, transmission line with the sinusoid, what happens when you put a pulse on it? Have you done bounce diagrams and the, and the like? Yes? So, all right, okay. that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. All right, cool, cool. Now, what we'll do is we'll also go through um, bounce diagrams, right? So, therefore, what happens, and, and this is absolutely key, is with transmission lines, most people, they just focus on sinusoidal steady state analysis, right? Which means, hey, I'm actually exciting this <laughs> transmission line with a sinusoidal signal. And an infinite time later, I'm going to look at what the current and the voltage on this signal, on this line, is going to be. Great, fantastic, but I, I'm not going to live for a lifetime, right? <laughs> you know, or an infinite amount of time. And especially since we're talking about, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, high-speed electronics, one of the things that's important to you is all of a sudden you switch on your power amplifier or you switch on your logic dance and all of a sudden it's trying to pull the voltage up on that transmission line. So all of a sudden you've got this transit, you've got this voltage wave that's travelling down the wave, oh, sorry, down the transmission line. It hits the discontinuity, starts coming back while the other one's still going forward and what, you, what happens is you start having constructive and destructive interference. Right? And that changes with time. And <coughs> what we'll show is under certain circumstances, you will have situations where the voltage can be many times the voltage that you've actually put on the line, especially if it's a lossless transmission. And why do, why do you care? Because that's what usually blows up your gates, or, you know, on your, or in your transistors, on your chips, or on your circuit. Right? So you, you've connected something with a transmission line, you go, oh, whack, switching it on, whack, bang, comes back, bang, there goes your gate, you're done. And then you've got to try to figure out what was the cause of it, which gate was blown, uh, all that kind of stuff. And that's what we'll go into greater detail in the, in the next couple of lectures. So we'll, we'll revise transmission lines, I'll start off with tra revising transmission lines from a steady state uh, perspective, which some of you have seen, right? Then we'll do the trans. We'll also do the transient analysis, which it seems like you, you haven't seen, but it's going to be, which is absolutely key when you're designing high-speed electronic circuits. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, I will won't punish you too much for today, and then uh, I think we can uh, leave it here. Or if you want, I can continue. What, the, what does everyone want? Start it, start afresh tomorrow on Friday. All right. Cool. All right. Good. <laughs> And I'm trying to find PhD students, so if, you, if you've got good marks and you're interested in doing a PhD, send me an email.
piece of metal. So that's the feed point, a small piece of metal, and this is the current distribution. So, what is the value So that's zero. That's the current. Oh, all right. Okay, so, so what I should do is I should go. That's all it is. So when it touches the metal, there is some current. Is that what I'm you just assuming that that's the current distribution in a small, infinitely small dipole. Uh, okay. so there's no current here. Oh, there's current there. There's no current. There's current here. There's current on the metal, but outside the metal, there's no current. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And, and likewise, if we go further down. Uh, sorry. No, 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 no. The next slide, I've here. actually got. Uh, no, no. Uh, in the small, in the small dipole, it's a triangle rather than a square. Uh, so, what is that the, the, the small? It's a distribution of current. Okay, all I've done. Okay, let me grab a. We got a pen. Oh, thank you. Okay, so it's should be in the box, but. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. okay. All I'm saying is the following, right? Um. Okay. We got a, a dipole, right? Yeah, that's all right. That's all I'm saying. We got a dipole. And let's make this dipole very small. So, so a small dot, infinitesimal dipole is one. Well, I can't spell right. Is one where the length is less than or less than L, just an L on fifty. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And on that one. The current, if we say that what the current is, it's constant. So the current, if, if I was saying what's the current, if I put zero current, I, I was saying the current is zero where the metal oh, is, oh, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And here, so here the current is I naught. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. All right. Then I said, we've got a small dipole, right? And a small dipole, I said, okay. And for a small dipole, all I was doing was I said, if it's a small dipole, the current does it's supposed to be a triangle, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's the same structure, yeah, just yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. So therefore, it goes to zero here, um, zero here, and it's I naught here at the feed yeah. point. Yeah. All right. And then what I said was, if we've got a finite or a dipole or a large dipole, which is less than a half a wavelength. What's important is it's still less than half a wavelength because if you've got over a wavelength then it your sinusoid continues. What happens there is the current <coughs> distribution is something like yeah. this. Sorry, they're supposed to line up, but this is sine z on L, you know, something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. you know, I'm just saying that it's a sin a sinusoidal distribution. That's all I was saying. And and each one of these has different. They've got different radiation resistance. All right. So they've got different fields and different radiation resistance. Now this one's eighty pi squared l length on lambda squared. Right. That's the radiation resistance of this one. This one's twenty pi squared lambda on lambda. L on lambda squared, right? And this one is some complex beast, which I can't write down for you, right? But I've given you the mathematics to be able to yeah. work it out. Okay. And then the other thing that I've done for you is I've worked out the directivity, and this is roughly 1.5. This is a little bit less. This is, uh, I can't remember, but it's 
some number when we've gone through the process. You can probably see it here. It's um, uh, yeah, but you can work. It, you can work it out. I mean, if, if you look here, oops, uh, it's probably you know you can work it out. Ninety on one eighty. You can work out what what that's uh, three sixty on ninety. So so it's going to be something like forty one thousand on three sixty by ninety. <coughs> is it, that's what it's going to be approximately. All right. Yeah. Using that crude approximation, and we might need to leave it a minute or so, because the, you know these guys are coming in here. It's complex, and you've got you know you can work it out. I don't know. Uh, where's the, there's an next page. Yeah, it gives you the the graphs on how to work it out. Okay. So it's complex, but that's the values, right? And what I've done, if you go to the next here. I've said, oh, if it's, you know, it's, this is the 3DD bandwidth. Remember, it's omnidirectional in one direction. You can actually work out what the directivity is from these numbers because you can actually use, because I've given you what the thing is, you can go simply to work out the directivity. It's 41,000 on 360 because it's omnidirectional. Say lambda, it's 47.8. When, say, uh, when, L, uh, when L equals lambda, and that's the directivity. All right, you can work it out from there in this formula. Right. It gives you the rough. Mm -hmm. And we, as the as the um, size of the antenna is larger, so the beam width actually decreases. Yeah, because you get more gain. No, so the the beam width is the yeah, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the beam width yeah. is no in a in a in, in the three. It's a half power of beam width. Yes. All right. So but so remember, it's a donut. Yeah. So, so the H remains the H yeah, yeah. because it's, it's a wire. So, therefore, but here, what happens in the in the uh, E plane? What happens is that's forty seven point eight. So from there to there is forty seven point eight for lambda for L equals lambda. So if it's smaller, we get more gain. No, you get less gain. Uh, less you get the bigger bandwidth, big beam width. Uh, bigger beam width. Maybe. Yes, lower gain. Lower gain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right, we better go. <laughs> uh, just a single question. And, uh, sure. I don't know. No, it's not. Uh, this means for I don't know why. Why this? And then I don't know the potential. No, no, no. I told you, just assume that that's what it is. Don't, don't, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't want you to derive, you can look it up and derive it, but it's just really complex. Okay. Just remember. Just remember. Yes. And what does this use for? And maybe in some questions. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Ah, yes. Because I don't want you to know how to derive it. That's really hard to derive. Uh, I'm glad you to remember this. No, 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 no. Oh, no, okay. Okay, okay. okay. And uh, for this, I just uh, coefficients. Yes. Oh, yes, so this, oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. All right, let me grab these and leave um, before we get kicked out. Uh, sorry, that, that, uh, Sorry, guys, let me just do this or else I'll lose all my notes and then I'll be, I won't know what I've taught you and what I haven't. isn't here yet, so it's okay. Yeah, I have 215. Uh, yeah, so because it starts at, there's, there's some convention that I didn't know. Supposedly at one, anything, at one it's one, or one, no, 115, uh, anything after, after lunch, after 12 starts at 115, I think. Okay. The, there's right. some so weird convention. Like, yeah, it's just, yeah, just, yeah, not all, because all the conditions for the earliest is like, yeah, there's no reason. No, no, we didn't, we didn't, I just, 
I didn't want to start a new topic and just get everyone to be like, oh, you started a new topic. <laughs> That's all it was. Yeah. And, 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 I, and it's, I think people are finding it heavy going, so I'm just trying to mm, okay. make, give people a little bit of a breather. Yeah. I was wondering, do you have any um, office hours I could go and see you like? Sure. Yeah. I've got, what I'll do is I'll put it on uh, the LMS. Yeah. But I'm thinking of doing it, uh, say, Tuesday morning at. Let me just check. Um, no, I can just need to talk about like what an electrical engineer actually does as a job later. Because I'm still thinking of what I want to do and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can so an electrical engineer does his job everything from driving for Uber yeah. in Australia <laughs> to, okay. uh, to actually designing chips or power stations. Okay. It really depends. Oh. Yeah. Um, but it really depends on what you're trying to do and what you're what you're interested in and your expertise and what's available okay. in Australia. Like for example, if you're doing chip design in hospital electronics in the UK, there's lots of companies that do that. So you'd find a job easily and then you would be able to do that. In Australia, it's a little bit harder. Okay, really? But okay. yeah, if there's less, less chip design opportunities. That's actually, because this is only my, well, the first semester of my third year, 